Praise the Lord. Amen. Believers, sink it to deeper life. I said, Praise the Lord. Amen. You have been coming to me at the IBTC, so I decided I'll come to your house. Amen. And here we are together today. I look around, I say, Ha, this one is mini deeper like Bagada. And when we finish, when we finish, well, I'm coming before we finish, but when we finish, we'll have Deeper Life Revival Center here. And um, let the leaders write down what I'm saying. Then we'll have a weekend retreat. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful today. Now because we're transmitting, I'm not allowed to say everything inside my heart. I'm supposed to go to the Bible study direct. God will bless you today. Somebody there said God will bless you today. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your people. Thank you for the provision of this place. And thank you for the joy of the Lord in the hearts of your children. I pray, Lord, the joy of the Lord will be our strength in Jesus' name. I'm asking, Lord, that you bless your people at the Bible study today. And show us the way we ought to go. And we pray that the grace and the strength to be everything we ought to be, you'll grant to every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're looking at John, 1 John chapter 3. We've been studying from the epistle of 1 John. And we now come to chapter 3. If you were with us last Monday, you will know that we spoke about the sons of God. It says, behold, in verse 1. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Even though John, the beloved, had been a child of God for a long time, but he did not stop to kind of surprise him because of the grace and because of the love and because of what came to him. That's why he said, Behold, what manner of love. The Father, the Heavenly Father, the one that hates sin, and yet the Bible says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and yet He loved us because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him, thank God I believe in Him. Somebody there said, I believe in Him, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And as John the believer thought about that, the sonship that we have, relationship that we have, that Calvary paid the price for our punishment. And now we are saying, we're born again. He said, I'm surprised. And everybody that ever tasted the grace of God expressed such a surprise. And then it said, therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not, be beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. If you're a child of God today, if the grace of God is in your life today, that day is coming, we will see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And then he tells us in verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. It's from that now he wants you to know if you're going to be part of this great privilege, if you're going to be part of the people that will see him on that final day when he said he will appear because Christ is coming again, he will take the church away. But he doesn't want you to be under any delusion. He wants you to know whether you are part of these glorious people we're talking about. That's why it now comes to verse 4. Because he has said, every man that has the hope, 
the hope of seeing the Lord and the hope of going with the Lord when he comes. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as Christ is pure. And that's the reason he wants to tell us now the marks of the believers who will go with him. The topic tonight is the identifying marks of born again believers. Those who are born again, those who have the grace of God, those who are waiting for the coming of Christ, and those who are going to see him on that day, and those who will go up in the rapture and go to heaven and make heaven their home forever. We're talking about the identifying marks of born again believers. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, our precious purging through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Our precious purging. He must purge us. He must purify us. He must cleanse us. If we're going to be ready and going to be prepared and going to be qualified for seeing him on that day. That's what we're talking about. Number one, our precious purging through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Number two, our perpetual purity, not just a temporary purity, a one-day purity, a Sunday-Sunday purity, perpetual all through our lives, every day, our perpetual purity through Christ's abiding salvation. He saves us. He forgives us. He sets us free. He changes our lives. And because of that abiding salvation, he grants us perpetual purity. Our perpetual purity through Christ's abiding salvation. Number three, the permanent purpose of Christ's assuring substitution. The permanent purpose of Christ's assuring substitution. Let's look at these things one by one. Number one is our precious purging through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Remember, we're looking at all this study and it concerns the marks, identify marks of born again believers. How do you know a born again believer? Somebody says, I'm born again. Another one says, I'm saved. Another one says, I'm a child of God. How do you know those who are members of the family of God? What are the marks? They identify marks by which you can know you are born again, you are a child of God. I will know I'm born again, I'm a child of God. And you'll know that person that is testifying, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God. And they shout loud, we're children of God. How do we know they're right? How do we know? How can we examine them from the watch of God? Number one, our precious purging through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Look at chapter 3 of 1 John. I'm reading from verses 4 and 5. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. You have to join verses 4 and 5 together for you to understand. When you read verse 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. When it says transgresses also the law, that means trespass. Sometimes you pass a community. And you put a fence around maybe a lawn, a field. And then the right there, trespassers will be prosecuted. What does that mean? That means they want to preserve that lawn. And they're preserving that place. And they say you must not trespass. You must not cross the line and get over on their field. That's what God is saying. He sets a boundary. And when he sets a boundary, he sets a good boundary around our lives. He sets a good boundary around our families. He sets a good boundary around our community. And then he says, don't cross that line. He says, this is my law. It's the law of God that checks us. That builds a fence. 
that makes us protect other people's lives and makes us protect the interest of God. And it says, trespassers will be prosecuted. And now it says in that chapter 3, verse 4, it says over here, whosoever committeth sin also uh, transgresses the law. Because sin is the transgression of the law. Can you remember any law that you ever broke in your life? Everybody can remember because it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no angel in the world. That is somebody who was born into this world and he just lived an angelic life. A pure life, a holy life, a righteous life. That's why the Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But then it says, but if we confess and forsake our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the reason he pardons us. And the reason he purges us. And the reason he sets us free. And the reason he counts us righteous is because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why it says, if you look at that verse 5, it says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin. That's a secret there. You are not righteous by yourself. Nobody is righteous by himself. Nobody is an angel by himself or herself. But now Christ came. And he died for us on the cross of Calvary. And he shed his blood. And through that blood of Jesus Christ, thank God, he will take all your sins away. Because it says, and ye know, that he was manifested. He was revealed. He came to this world to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. That's the uniform testimony of the word of God. Look at John chapter 1. Gospel according to St. John. John chapter 1. We're looking at verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. And says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He will take your sins away. You see, that's why Jesus came and said, And you know, you must know this. This is the mark of the people who are going to heaven. Of course, we know we were all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then we know something. If that's all you know, some people say, I know I'm a sinner. Tell me another thing. That's all I know. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. If that's all you know, there's no heaven. But now we know that Christ, the Holy One, Christ, the Savior, Christ, the Lord, Christ, the perfect one, and Christ, that the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We know that he was manifested to take away our sin and in him is no sin. That's why John said, Behold the Lamb. If you're feeling the guilt of your sin, behold the Lamb. You're feeling the condemnation of your sin, behold the Lamb. You're feeling the judgment that is coming as a result of your sin. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It will take all your sins away. Look at verse 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, it says, Behold the Lamb of God. That's not the Lamb of man. You see, there are people, they have their own religion. And in their religion, they'll take a lamb. That's what the Israelites did for a long time. But God said, enough of shedding animal blood now Jesus Christ my only begotten son he is the one that came to die for us and he died for you so that you will not die he died for you so that you will not perish he died for you you don't have any excuse if you are not saved because look at Jesus Christ he said father forgive them they know not what they do and if you will say that's me that's me Lord forgive me today he will forgive you he will change your life and you'll never be the same again in Jesus name and look at this in chapter 8 of John. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 36. John chapter 8 verse 36. It tells us in verse 36. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Somebody is getting free over there. 
the Son of God, Jesus Christ. His blood is so powerful. His sacrifice is acceptable to God. And that's why Jesus said, I can set you free. All the bondage of sin, I can set you free. All the yoke of sin, I can set you free. All the defilement of sin, I can cleanse you. I can make you pure. I can cleanse your heart. I can cleanse your mind. I can cleanse your soul. I can so cleanse you. There will be no remembrance of what you did in the past. That's why, why he said, If the Son that therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You will be free. Because that's why he came. That's why he came. He said, and ye know that he, Christ, was manifested that he might take away your sin. And in him is no sin. He didn't have any sin of his own to take away. He died for you. It was for your sin. He died for your guilt. He died for your condemnation that he died. So that you will not be condemned again. And let's look at Matthew chapter 26. And we're reading from verse 28. Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 28, he said, For this is my blood. Think about that. He said it so categorically. And he said it with certainty. He said it with assurance that you will not have any doubt in your heart at all. Maybe he can cleanse me. Maybe he can save me. Maybe he can set me. He said, no. He said, there is a certainty here. And there is an understanding here. He says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Thank God I'm part of that many. I said I'm part of that many. Because if you believe, that's all. If you believe, that's all. He died for me, that's all. And you're not transferring it to other people. He died for them. Those are Christians. He died for them. Those are church people. He died for them. If you say, Jesus died for me. God is no respecter of persons. He loves everyone. And he loves you. And that's why he said Jesus Christ. And Jesus said pointedly. And Jesus said very plainly, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the removal, for the cleansing, for the remission of sins. Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, we find believers thanking God. We find believers praising the Lord. He cleansed us. He washed us. He pardoned us. He took our sins away. And because of that, we can rejoice. I pray that this joy of salvation will be yours in Jesus' name. Look at this in verse 5 of Revelation chapter 1. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that tell me loved us he loves you somebody there said he loves you what is the person that knows god loves him he loves you he said unto him that loved us and washed us stop for a moment look up here your mother and you saw your child fed in dirty dirty things and the child is thinking and the child is i'm so dirty i'm so dirty and she cannot find water to wash herself. And she cannot find sponge or soap to wash herself. And you love this child dearly. You love the child so much. You don't want any defilement or dirt on, on the child. What are you going to do? You are going to do what a mother will do. A loving mother will do. You'll take that child. You'll take water. You'll wash that child. And the child will smile and say, I am clean Jesus loves you more than any mama, mother can ever love you. If your mother will clean you up when you were young, when you couldn't clean up yourself, Jesus will do more. That's why it says over here, unto him that loved us, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Say that for yourself, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Don't ever allow anybody to plant any doubt in your heart. Maybe I'm so bad, God does not love me. That's why he commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And because of that love, you will see that love today. 
unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Thank God he has done it for me. I said he has done it for me. If you have not got it yet, he'll do it for you in Jesus' name. What step do we take? How do we come for that cleansing? How do we come for that purging? What can we do? Because now he shared his blood. And he said, whosoever cometh unto him, he will in no wise cast out. There's something he expects that you will do, that everybody will do before that cleansing, that purging, that pardon will come unto them. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, it tells us in verse 46 and verse 47, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. He's talking about his crucifixion. And thus he befitted Christ to suffer. He's talking about his sacrifice. He said, and thus he behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. The third day, listen to this, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He expects that you must desire to be clean. And when you fell, the well you fell into. And the dead you see you fell into. And now you see yourself that this is unclean. I'm even smelling to myself. I'm stinking. And people see me that I'm dirty. It means that you will not want to go back to that pit again. That's what is called repentance. Because you went there, it made you dirty. You went there, it made you to be stinking. You went there, it brought disgrace. You went there, it brought calamity upon your life. You went there, and now you are rejected by heaven. The first thing you want to do is that, that pit, I will not be there again. I'm dirty enough. I, I'm just looking for cleansing right now. You turn away from the dirty things. You turn away from the dirty language. You turn away from the evil things. Say, Lord, now the past already I'm dirty. I don't want to be dirtier, dirtier, dirtier. I don't want to fall in there again, but I need cleansing. And then the blood of Jesus Christ will come and wash away all your sins. And then there will be joy in your heart. That's the joy of salvation. You will know he has forgiven me. He has cleansed me. And now I am clean. Repentance is very important. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 19. It tells us in verse 19. Acts chapter 3. Here in verse 19 it says, Repent ye therefore. You see that word therefore? He said, You want to be clean? Repent ye therefore. You want to get to heaven? Repent ye therefore. You want to be pardoned? You want to be forgiven? Repent ye therefore. You want to be in favor with God? Repent ye therefore. You want to go to heaven when you die? Repent ye therefore. You want this cleansing to take place? And what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary to be yours? It will be yours in Jesus' name. It says, if that is going to be repent ye therefore, look at the next thing there, and be converted and be converted, and be converted. Let there be a transformation. Let there be conversion. That I was going that way before, that way is evil. That way is deadly. That way is dangerous. It's a broad way that leads to eternal damnation. And therefore, I don't want to perish. I'm saying for myself, I don't want to perish. I said I don't want to perish. And going on that broad way that everybody is going will make them perish. So, because I don't want to perish, I turn back. And then, I now follow the narrow path that leads to heaven. And I say, thank God, he got me out of that broad way. Thank God, he got me out of that way of destruction. And now, I'm following the narrow path that leads to heaven. Heaven is my goal. Somebody there, heaven is my goal. I will get Get there, you will get there in Jesus' name. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. See that? 
when you repent, when you turn away from that sin, when you say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I will not perish because he is coming and we shall see him as he is. And when he comes and we see him, we will go with him. That's why it says, if that is the case, you repent, you turn away from sin, you are converted and your sins will be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Look at verse 26. Unto you first God, having restored his son, Jesus, sent him to, tell me, to bless you. What's the blessing in turning away every one of you from his iniquities? Iniquities in the plural. He'll turn us away from all our sins in Jesus' name. And then he gives us a new life. And now he has purged us. He has pardoned us. He has purified us. And all those dirty things in our record, everything is blotted away. And he writes your name in the book of life. I said he writes your name in the book of life. Then you will know, praise the Lord, the Spirit of God is bearing witness in my heart that I am a child of God. Look at Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, you see what the Lord does when he forgives us. What the Lord does when he purges us. What the Lord does when he takes our sins away. And let me make it for you. When he takes your sins away, what he will do for you. I said what he will do for you. Luke chapter 10 verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. But rather, rather, but rather because, because. Because your names are written in heaven. Look up here. You know the people that they just go to church. They go to church. They do all that the church people are doing. And they never repent. And they never tell the Lord forgive me. And they never say I need salvation. They never say I need to be born again. They go to church. They come out. They go to church. They come out. And the Lord is holding the pain in heaven. He, on the book of life, he wants to write their name, but they must repent before he writes their name. And the Lord is saying, okay, they came today, they'll call upon me, because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the Lord waited, waited, waited. They just say, you know, after, after service, they just say, oh, it was a wonderful service. I like that singing. I like all the choruses. I like the Bible reading. I like the choir. I like everything. And the Lord is waiting for them to write their name and then they go and God is disappointed that they came he could have written their name in the book of life they didn't give God a chance they come the following Monday they come the following Thursday they come the following Sunday and the Lord said I know that my servant will preach the word unto them he will show them Calvary he will show them Christ he will show them the blood of Jesus and he's holding the heavenly pen wanting to write their name again they just come and God is disappointed. Maybe you are like that. You will be coming and coming. And the Lord said, let me write your name in the book of life. Just turn away from your sin and you will be saved. Today, it will happen. If you have not allowed God to write your name in the book of life, today is the day. Because only the people that have their names in the book of life, when that trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive will be caught up together with them. Only those people, their names are there. My name is written there. My name is written there. In the book of God's kingdom, my name is written there. The people who don't have their names there, they will regret forever and ever. I will not regret. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever is not uh, just coming to church, is not just, uh, you know, participating in all the good things we're doing, but whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I pray that this gospel we're hearing will do good in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Come back to First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. First John chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know, now I know. And ye know, now I know. And ye know, tell me. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin if you know that he was manifested to take away your sin why don't you present yourself before the lord and say lord here am i look at the sin inside here look at my habit look at my heart look at my language look at my disposition look at my attitude look at the secret things i do and since you have come to take my sins away here am i he will take your sins away. That's the, that's the precious, uh, the precious purging through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Point number two now, our perpetual purity through Christ's abiding uh, salvation. Our perpetual purity. And uh, let me explain to you, number one is the word purity, purity. Look at verse 3. First John chapter 3, verse 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. He's talking about the hope of seeing Christ when he comes. The hope of marching in with the saints, when the saints are marching in. The hope of getting to heaven, when Christ will come again. And he says, every man that has this hope, Hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Let me ask you, do you have the hope? Meet somebody on the street and say, what's your hope? You will be surprised what they say. I say, what's your hope? I hope that uh, this year I will build a house. I say, I hear you. How about you? What's your hope? I hope this year I will get married. What's your hope? I hope uh, this year I will have children. What's your hope? I hope this year I will travel to America. I said, what's your hope? I hope this year they will increase my salary. They do not have the hope of heaven. They do not have hope. Christ is coming. I hope when he comes, I will go with him. They do not have any hope for the future. All the hope they think about, even those who go to church, even those who go to these great gatherings of uh, Christian religious people, I hope I'll get healed. I hope I get delivered. I hope I get money. I hope I get prosperity. I hope they prophesy on me. I hope I build a new house. I hope I park my car in the garage over there. I hope, I hope, I hope. And they never think of the hope of seeing Christ when he comes. But you know what the Bible says? It says everyone that has this hope, the lively hope, the hope of getting to heaven and the hope of spending eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. Every man that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. Here we are. There are some people that say, I'm not too bad after all. I'm better than so and so. I'm better than such and such. After all, I had what David did. I've not even done that. I'm better than David. After all, I heard of what so and so did. I'm better than them. I heard of what Judas Iscariot did. I'm better than Judas Iscariot. It is not everyone that has this who purifies himself, even as Abraham is pure, even as David is pure. Even as Solomon is pure, even as Samson is pure, even as Peter is pure, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Tell me the rest. Even as he, Christ, is pure. And you know, what's the purity of Christ? He just told you in verse 5. It says in him there is no sin. He wants to so take the sin away from your life. You will look like Jesus. I said that sister Jesus right there. 
I said, that's brother Jesus right there. Because he cleanses you, he washes you, and he makes you like him. And then perpetual. Why perpetual purity? Perpetual because we don't know when it will come. If you were pure yesterday, and then today, now temptation comes, and then you are not pure today, and Christ comes, what will happen to you? You've been keeping pure one week, one month, one year, pure child of God. You will not yield to temptation. All of a sudden, and you have been saying, Christ is coming, Christ is coming, Christ is coming, and Christ has not come, and temptation comes, and then secretly, you yield to that, and then the trumpet sounds. Where will you be? Where will you spend eternity? That's why the purity must be perpetual. God helped you yesterday, it will help you today. If he can help you one hour to be pure, he can help you for two hours to be pure. If, I, if he can help you for two hours, he can help you for ten hours. He can help you for one day in the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, to be pure. You say, today, one day at a time. One day at a time. I live today and I'm saying, oh Lord, I need purity today. I want to remain pure today. Any temptation that comes today, forget about tomorrow. The Lord has forgiven your past. Today, this present hour, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He will be with you. He will strengthen you. We can come to the throne of grace and receive help in the time of need. And this day, he keeps you pure. One day at a time. And then in the evening, you look back during the day. Praise the Lord today. He gave me victory. Praise the Lord today. He kept me pure. I'm talking about you there. I said today will keep you pure. It cleanses you from past defilement. And today it gives you the grace to remain pure. And then tomorrow, that's another day. One day, one day at a time, you are pure today. You are pure another day. You are pure another day. It will keep you perpetually pure. It's perpetual purity. And it is through Christ abiding salvation. See what Christ came to do. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 and see what Christ came to do. And as a result of what Christ came to do, that's how he makes you pure and that's why he keeps you pure. Matthew chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth his son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. I am one of his people. He will save you from your sin. He'll have compassion on you. He knows you are not strong by yourself. He knows you are not a, you are not a stable person by yourself. But you say, Lord, I want to be clean. I need your help. I need your grace. That's why you came. And you came for me so that I will not perish. I will not perish. I said, I will not perish. That heaven that Jesus Christ has gone to prepare for us, look at me, I will be there. And because you want to be there, and he wants to take you there, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he, by his power, and he, by his sustenance, and he, by his grace, he will save you from your sin. That's what he came to do. He will do it for you. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, For but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, we didn't have any strength. We didn't have any power. We grew to overcome temptation by ourselves. You know, some people, they think that they will struggle, they will try, they will turn over a new leaf, and then they'll live righteous. No, it's the strength of the Lord himself. It is the grace of God himself. Yeah, he helped people that went before us, he will help us. Look at this in verse 9, much more than being made, being uh, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 
we shall be saved by his life. Let's come back to First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. First John chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Look up here for a moment. I hope you understand what this means. What it means is this. In the community, outside, they're throwing stones at people. And then it hits somebody's head over there. Cry, my head, my head. And then they throw another one, hit somebody at the neck, my neck, my neck. But you, you abide inside your house. And you close the door. And you are enjoying reading the Bible while you are inside. The people outside, they are throwing things at them. It hit their head. It hit this one. hit this one. Because you abide inside your house, will it come to you? When you abide in Christ. The people who do not abide in Christ, the people, you know, they go here, they go there, they go to other things, and then Satan finds them, and demons find them, and tempters find them, temptresses find them, and all those uh, people find them, they lure them into evil. But the people who are abiding in Christ, they say, I am in Christ. I want to dwell in Christ. I want to abide in Christ. I enjoy the fellowship of Christ. I enjoy the salvation of the Lord. He is hiding me in his pavilion and I'm not going to go into those evil things in the world. Those people who abide in Christ, it will keep them and as you abide, it will keep you. I said it will keep you. Don't tell me that you know I am so weak. If you are weak, abide in Christ. If you are not strong, abide in Christ. Abide in the salvation of the Lord. Everyone that abides. Didn't you see the children of Israel? They, what they did is they killed the lamb. And then they put the blood of the lamb on the lintels of their houses. And they remained inside the house under the blood. The blood of Jesus has been shed for you. And as you abide inside that protection of the blood of Jesus, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I say, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The temptation will not have power. All those trials will not have power because you are abiding in Christ. You don't allow anybody to draw you out and pull you out from abiding in Christ. Once you abide, the protection will be upon your life. Look at that verse again now. That's in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Temptation will come, will knock at the door. He'll say, Jesus, I can't open the door for that temptation. Open the door and meet them. And Jesus will conquer for you. And then it says, Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. I want to remind you, if there was any time, let's say you're a believer, any time that shadow temptation came to you as a surprise, and then if you fail, I want to remind you, you see, that morning, I want to go and do this. I want to go and do this. I want to go and do that. You didn't remember Christ. You didn't remember your quiet time. You didn't remember prayer. You didn't remember that outside there, there are dangers. Outside there, there's temptation. You didn't remember, and then you rushed out. And then business enterprise and business discussion and this and that. It's like you were absent-minded. The Lord that was with you, watching everything that you did, you didn't remember. And the Lord that is saying, remember, the trumpet can sound at any time. You didn't remember that because you rushed out. And because of that, then you fell flat on your face. You came back to the house. You were crying, me. How could that happen to me? How will that not happen to you? Did, did you abide in Christ? Did you say today, help me by your grace? Did you say today, go before me? Did you say today, help me that I will not disappoint heaven? I will not disappoint you. But now you come back and the Lord will forgive you. After the Lord has forgiven you, the pitfall where we fell before. Don't fall there the second time. The mistake we made before, don't make that mistake the second time. And the thing that jolted you and surprised you into evil, it will not happen the second time. 
Now, before you go out, you say, no matter what is there, that thing will wait for me. I must have fellowship with Jesus. Whatever is out there, I'm not in a hurry. I must start my day with Christ. He must give me the word. He knows the temptations of the day. He, know, he knows the challenges of the day. And if you will start the day with Christ, you'll be stronger. If you start the day with Christ, you'll be more victorious. He make you more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Come to that verse again. A sinner, if you understand better. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth, has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, but seven. Let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. I will not be deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, Christ, is righteous. He is the one that will make you righteous. He'll purify you. He'll purge your life. He'll make you totally new. And if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, I said behold, all things are become new. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth we should not serve sin. Come to verse 6. Look at this. I'm going to read it for you now. Are you there? Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Knowing this, that my old man is crucified with him. I said, knowing this, that my old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth I should not serve sin. Because you are not a servant of sin anymore. You are not a slave of sin anymore. You are now a child of God. And the grace of God abides in you. Look at chapter 6 verse 18. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. Let's look at chapter 8, reading from verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You see that? In Christ Jesus, not those who have strayed away outside Christ. They remain in Christ. They remain under his cover. They remain in his grace. They remain in his protection. And they remain in his presence. It says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. Who walk not after the flesh. But tell me, after the spirit, look up here for a moment. Walking is in your hand. It's your choice. Let's say, for example, there's a street over there. You've not been there, but you're hearing noise. You've not been there. You're hearing some sound. And you know that, that kind of sound looks like there's insecurity there. Looks like there's a problem there. Walking. You want to go to from A to B. That's not the only road. Because you are hearing that sound there, you turn. You are not walking on this road, but you take this road, you'll still get to where you are going. I said you'll get to where you are going. I said you will get to where you are going. We don't have to go through that road compulsorily. It's telling us this is the road of the flesh. Those who walk after the flesh, they perish. Those who walk after the flesh, they drown their souls in perdition. But that's not the only road. The Sandra road there is the road of the spirit. Where you're free. Where there's no condemnation. 
where there's no guilt, where you make up your mind, I'm not going to walk that road, I'm going to walk this road, then there'll be no condemnation upon your life. You see, every day you have to make a choice. A choice not to walk in the flesh, because it's your choice, but a choice to walk in the spirit. Look at verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Thank God you are free. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 25. 7, 25. Hebrews chapter 7. Reading from verse 25. It says in verse 25, Wherefore, he is able. Tell me he is able. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Do you know that Jesus is praying for you? Of course, of course, he shed his blood for you. You know, some people, the way they talk about uh, the Christian life, they say, I'm saved, but I don't know whether that I will, what I will go through till the end. Hey, why do you say that? The one who saved you is so interested you get to heaven. He is more interested than you get to heaven than anybody on earth is interested you get to heaven. See, if you don't get there, if I don't get there, if we don't get there, that place will be empty. My seat is there. My mansion is there. My place is there. Nobody else will replace me. You'll be there. And Christ is interested that you are there. That's why it says he is able to save them to the uttermost. Now I can relax because he who has power to save me, he has power to keep me. He will keep you. Look at verse 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That tells us then that Jesus Christ is so much interested that we get there. And by the grace of God, you will get there. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 24. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who is own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. We're not to live unto righteousness. You'll be righteous. Then it says, by whose tribes ye were healed. By whose tribes ye were healed. You are healed in Jesus' name. What effort do we make now? What preparation do we make so that all that Christ has done will be ours, will be mine, will be yours? Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 3. It says, according to his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. We don't have any excuse. He has given unto us. He has given unto you all things that pertain to life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. He has not called you to disgrace. He has called you to glory. He has not called you to vice, to evil. He has called you to virtue. What he has called you to, you will have in Jesus' name. Your life will be beautiful. Look at verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Ye might be partakers of ye might be partakers of I will be partakers of of the divine nature. Look up here for a moment. You know, I see somebody and he says, I'm a Christian. And then something slight, literally like this happens. And then he flares up. He's angry. 
and he's fuming and he's trembling and shaking and then you're afraid you think he might take whatever is near and then smash you and then after that the fire comes down and then you say my friend what happened to you the way i saw you i was afraid I, I didn't know that there was any lion living inside you but when i saw your face i was afraid you might do anything oh he says you know that's how my father was that's how my mommy was and when that thing comes on me like this it's the nature of my father i say which father are you talking about the one here in the village or the one up there our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name when you became born again the other nature coming from your father in the village that one dropped on the ground and then he now makes you the partaker of divine nature and of the nature of jesus gentle jesus loving jesus lowly jesus meek jesus that's the nature you now have say that's the nature i now have don't confess don't accept that other nature that's foreign that's strange that's not yours anymore it says that she may be partakers of the divine nature have been escaped thank god i've escaped having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue keep on adding and then add to your virtue knowledge keep on adding add to your knowledge temperance keep on adding add to temperance uh, patience keep on adding add to patience godliness keep on adding and add to godliness brotherly brotherly kindness keep on adding and add to brotherly kindness charity you know the problem of people i'm saved i'm born again and they do not add anything to that i'm a child of god they don't add anything to that but the lord is saying he puts all this in front of you and say pick them and add that to your life self-control add that one kindness add that one you have the divine nature ready that's the foundation that's the basis and now you keep on adding the grace of god adding the godliness and adding the faithfulness adding gentleness you are not gentle before add that today look at something missing in your life and look at say i didn't have that i didn't have that but tonight i'm going to add something before i leave I said I will add something before I leave. And then, as you get back to the office, as you get back at home, people see you. They said, I see something in you. They say, what's that? What do you see? I see self-control. You don't talk anyhow anymore. You don't get angry. You don't fight anymore. Yes, I added that at the Monday Bible study. You must add something today. What are you? I said you must add something today. Let, let, let me see which one you want to add you know one by one one by one if i can add this one this week this week i add that i said lord give me the chance and give me the grace to add this one and then the following week i want to add this one the following week i want to add this one the next time i come back here and i see you you're already radiant you're already wonderful but the next time when i see you i'll see that you have added much to your spiritual life Look at it in verse 5. And beside that, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity you will add something before you go. We come to point number three now. The permanent purpose of Christ's assuring substitution. He came to take our place and the purpose of his taking our place, here is it. Look at chapter 3, first John chapter 3 verses 8 and 9. It says, He that committed sin is of the devil. For the sin, devil sinneth from the beginning. I hope you understand that. He that committeth sin. is talking about the people that make a practice of committing sin. They don't even try to escape. They don't even try to resist. Resist the devil and it will flee from you. They just say, well, it's coming. And once it comes, what can I do? It's coming. The devil told me to tell a lie. What can I do? 
The devil told me to steal. What can I do? The devil told me to fight. What can I do? They surrender themselves as slaves of Satan. I will not surrender to Satan. Resist the devil and he will flee from you because he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. Look at this verse 8. For this purpose. The son of God was manifested that he might destroy. Tell me. The works of the devil. Give Jesus a chance in your life. It will destroy all the works of the devil in Jesus' name. You know, he wants you to sin so that that's the devil wants you to sin so that you will perish and spend eternity with him in hellfire. But say, devil, you missed your way today. Now I know the truth. I will not perish. Now I know the truth. I will not serve you. I belong to Jesus. And because I belong to Jesus, his grace will flow in me. His grace will help me. I will no more follow Satan anymore. That's why it says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. I'm born of God. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he doesn't want to. He cannot sin because he is born of God. When you are born again, the nature of God comes to you. And then he sets you free. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, that he is the devil. Look up here. Who is greater, Satan or Jesus? Who is more powerful, Satan or Jesus? Who will overcome or who will control your life, Satan or Jesus? Look up, you are standing here and Satan is standing there and Jesus is standing here. Who is nearer to you? Who is closer to you? Tell me. And Satan now, far away, is tempting you. He says, do this, do this. You didn't remember, Jesus is closer, is nearby. You can't tell the devil, Satan, shut up. I don't belong to you anymore. I am not under your control. Here is my savior. Here is my Jesus. Here is the lover of my soul, Satan. You didn't do anything for me. When I was sorrowful, you made me more sorrowful. When I was sick, you wanted me to die. When I had challenges, failure, you told me to commit suicide. Get away from me. Here is my Jesus helping me. Here is my Jesus whispering to me saying that failure is not final. I will help you. He is the one whispering to me, I will give you grace. I will strengthen you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And he is mightier than Satan. I lean towards Jesus. I say, help me. Help me. Silence that devil. It will silence Satan in your life. But you know, the people who fall is because they don't know that Jesus is near. And they know I belong to Jesus. And he belongs to me. And he's helping me. And it will silence that devil. Resist the devil. And it will flee from you. Today, you escape from his snare in Jesus' name. Because he has power to destroy him that has the power of death. Even the devil, he will destroy him out of your life in Jesus' name. Uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 6. We read it before. It's good to read it again. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6. We're reading from verse 6. It says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. We read this before, but can you look up for a moment? Look at that thief on the cross. You remember when Jesus was crucified, there was one thief here, another thief here. Do you remember the story? That thief is now on the cross. The nail is hands. 
the nail, the feet, and now he's helpest on the cross. He was powerful before when he was on our street. But now that he is crucified, are you afraid of him? He cannot come down and hurt you. It's not as powerful as it was before he was crucified. Look at this. Our old man, our old nature is crucified. That old nature, before we knew Jesus Christ, was strong and mighty, was powerful, and could make us do this and do this. We were helpless. The old nature, because he was free, but that old nature, when we came to Christ, that old nature is nailed to the cross. That old nature is not powerful enough to conquer me anymore. I said that old nature is not powerful enough to conquer me anymore. You will overcome. I said you will overcome. Look at this. Knowing this, you must know, you must know. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That ends forth from today, ends forth, this is a new day, ends forth, it's a new dawn, ends forth, we shall not serve sin. Your victory has come. Look at, let's come back to First John. First John, we're reading now from chapter 3. First John chapter 3, I read verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest. Those who understand the old man is crucified. Those who understand the old nature is crucified. Those who understand, we're new Christians, we're new creatures in Christ. It says, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth his brother. Praise the Lord that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He lives inside me. And when the devil comes and brings temptation from outside, I say, no, I'm not going to fall. I will stand. I said, I will stand. Where is the person I'm talking about? You will stand. And you're sitting down. I will stand. I will stand. You will not fall. Tell the Lord. He has all the grace you need. He has all the strength you need. He has all the righteousness you need. It will help you. And if you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you tell him today and say, Lord, I hand over my sin unto you. I surrender my life unto you. I open the door of my heart unto you. Come in. Come in. Come in and stay with me. Come in. Abide with me. And come in and strengthen me. And let your grace be abundant in my life. Open your mouth and pray and tell the Lord he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He doesn't want you to perish. And whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't go yet. Don't go yet. Pray and tell the Lord. If you're a believer, add patience, add goodliness, add kindness, add charity. Keep on adding to your life and be strong and stronger and stronger every day. And the Lord will help you. He will keep you faithful and keep you pure and keep you righteous until the final day. And when it shall come, you'll go with the people of God and be with Jesus forever and ever.